Yeah, I can make this go. All right. So I know um, most of you probably get the reference, but, but for those of you who somehow escaped middle school or are not um, intimately familiar with the filmography of, um, I don't know, Leonardo DiCaprio, I suppose is who you'd know, but it's Romeo and Juliet. And um, the, uh, the, the point of uh, what's in a name is, is Juliet saying, you know, uh, why do you have to be Romeo? And uh, it's really not the name of the thing, but but the essence of the thing that matters. So it's kind of the framework of the how how I'm approaching this topic. And what I'd like to do is first just I want to get a sense of who's here and what um, what do you call yourselves? So when not maybe not to other people in the industry, or like not to your not to your grandmother, your mom, because I'd say I design websites and that's good enough, but what what would you call and you know if we were meeting together today and you you had to put on your name tag I am a whatever in 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 our group, what would you call yourself? I called myself a UX design manager, for example. Um, what go ahead and hit the chat. Tell me what you call yourselves. All right, good. Thank you. He's a researcher. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Yeah, you a person. person. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be vague about it, but yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> the human beings. Well, this is from 10 years ago. Um, here's a, a from from Euro IA, that's information architecture. That's when that was kind of the, the going phrase. Um, but uh, the, the, dominant, the dominant title there at the time was user experience designer, but you can also see some other things sprinkled in, this kind of user experience consultant where we, we have um, kind of the business role in, implied there. Um, information architect, which I'm not sure anyone calls himself information architect anymore. Um, that, that has definitely um, gone out of fashion in, in the subsequent 10 years. Um, interaction designer has probably ramped up in my experience. Uh, user experience architect is another one that you will occasionally hear and um, you will see kind of various senior levels of this or managers of that or, you know, that, that the kind of hierarchy that's implied usually by wherever you work is what, what you're called. And to some extent, I, I find the same thing in, um, in, in, the, in the titles. You, so if you have a culture that tends to call people like you architects, you're probably going to be a user experience architect. Or if they call you, in, if you're in an engineering culture, it wouldn't be unusual to be called an engineer. My neighborhood's getting funky there in the back. Sorry. Um, so it it what I don't what I what I want us to kind of consider now is the the title that you go by is is sometimes an artifact of where you work and and it really doesn't um, it really doesn't tell us a whole lot about what you what you actually do and so what I want us to focus on is really think about competencies not titles titles can be very misleading they can be misleading in um, job advertisements they can be misleading in what people say they are. Um, I remember there was a rash of, of people who were definitely graphic designers um, calling themselves user experience designers and um, it was very clear that they were not um, and really didn't quite know what it meant. But think about think about the skills and the, 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 the competencies that you need and not the titles. So this is kind of my this is my working structure um, kind of day-to-day -day if you if you woke me up in the middle of the night and said, you know, what what are the, what is UX? What are the pieces of UX? This is this is what I would come up with. Um, your 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 researcher. These are kind of nothing without the users. They 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 they're not working in my opinion unless they're with the users or or, or getting synthesis uh, from their time with the with the users. And this is kind of typically what they they're going to be doing and what that output um, may look like. UX design, I, I just boil it down to it's user-centered something. Um, and oftentimes what we bring to the table in, in UX design is that user-centered aspect. So 
in any kind of complexity of project, um, internal, internally facing or external business to consumer, or whatever, um, there are going to be lots of demands put on any product or service. And the UX designer is typically the one who is kind of holding, holding the line on the, the users. Uh, and um, so I, I just kind of boiled it down to just user centered, but um, Typic, not that the others can't be, but they're specifically um, the user-centered user advocates. But um, so information architecture falls under them. So even though that name's fallen out of favor, the, the work still remains, which is um, information needs to be constructed on a page. Um, navigation flows and then some basic layout and what I call widget level fidelity or kind of low to medium fidelity maybe. Um, then interaction design, what comes to mind when, when I think of that term uh, is, and that competency is there's a lot of sweat in the details of, of putting together uh, a product. So there's, this is where I expect to see sort of detailed uh, specs. I expect something that's very close. It's closer to the code level. Uh, it doesn't have to be coded by that person, but it's going to be a very direct input into whoever is going to code it. I think about micro interactions. Um, I, I, there was a, I, don't know, I hope he's on, but I don't think he is. His name was Alan Valak. He works up in Houston and I, he would, um, he would, he would spend hours working on animations and viewports and really like agonizing over, um, you know, how the, 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 the widget worked. Um, and, and that's kind of what I think of with interaction design is you're really into a pretty deep level um, of, of the product. And you're typically almost always going to have some kind of motion or animation as part of what you're doing. I mean, the, 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 the web has things that move on it. And uh, I look for the interaction designer for that um, or interaction design competency. See, so yeah, it's, it's easy to fall back into titles. Um, and then the, the, the fourth kind of big bucket that I think about is, is visual design. And this is what they bring to the table and what this competency brings, making a connection with people, um, making things in, uh, on brand, engaging, desirable. That's where, that's where this competency, this skill really shines. So I've collected over many years and that will, um, I'm, I'm preempting some of the, um, what would you call them, pixelated images you might see, because I've gotten these from different places over time. Um, but I, I wanted to kind of draw together some different ways that people have thought about this because it is not at all clear nor settled. Um, and I think this is, to me, the kind of one of the earliest versions this, uh, uh, of trying to really do some self-analysis of what is user experience, and this is uh, I think you'll probably recognize uh, Jesse James Garrett from uh, Elements of User Experience. And uh, we're, we're kind of, I, I, I pulled out these big red arrows that you'll see because uh, it's going to take a minute to parse all these. So I'm trying to point you in the right direction. Um, but we're kind of in this layer typically that is where we're kind of working and our skills are kind of in this general top area. We'll sometimes get down into here, but oftentimes we're, we're picking up about this pink and, and moving um, up into the concrete. But this is kind of the, the granddaddy image as far as I'm concerned about how this is. And now I have to prepare you a bit for Venn diagrams that are, that are coming up. Um, you can find where you might live in the, the Venn diagram. I am the people who can and can't read Venn diagrams and don't want to. This is, this is my segment. Um, you may be in the people who can and can't read Venn diagrams and want and don't want to. So there's that, but Venn diagrams are coming. Here we go. Um, apparently we, we, we have to have uh, circles in, and you'll see it. It's, it's remarkable how, how much circles are part of our modeling and how we think about ourselves. But um, Here's one that I find probably interesting if I really had a long time to think about it and look at it. But UX is there in the middle, and then uh, kind of you see the business analysis on the left side and bottom, and then the visual design, and then the prototyping. I don't know, it might make sense, but you can see there's a lot of overlapping uh, circles in our, 
our Venn diagram trying to be shown here. Mm, not gonna take a long time on that one. Here's one, I think this is Dan Saffer, right? Um, I called out a couple of the, those red highlights are mine, just for your reference, but I wanted to highlight visual design there is that little smaller egg inside and then the, the bigger circle is um, information design, or sorry, user experience design. But to me, this gets a little bit closer to the, to the point, which is we all realize that, that, or we either experience or we feel even inside ourselves, but you certainly see there's, there is this concept of overlap. There isn't a clean, I am a this, and, and I do this and only this. It, our, our, our discipline is not that clean, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word. But there's this always this, I'm, I'm, I'm doing some of this and some of that and some of that, but, but, I, but I feel like this is, is getting us closer to the murkiness of, of how uh, it can sometimes feel in UX design where we have a, a big pot of, of, inf of interaction design here it overlaps, yes, with visual design. Uh, a common element that, that we'll see in, in these models is the, the UX tends to be the big, the, the big circle, right? It, it, so interaction design, visual design, spatial experience, information architecture, information design, these things all kind of typically fit within the broad UX uh, title. And then you can kind of get outside and think about like, is human computer interaction and human factors, is that getting outside of user experience? Um, audio engineering seems further outside. Sociology is there, but doesn't really touch. So, you know, there's, there, there's, it's trying to pull, pull in a picture that's, that's showing you there's a lot going on and it's overlapping and there's a lot of competencies. Um, I don't even want to say intention. I think they're largely complementary, but there's a lot going on. It's, it's certainly um, what we call it. Um, here's one, uh, Nathan Shred uh, Shedruff. Uh, this is a, a, a fairly broad interpretation, I would say, of, of user experience, where we have that kind of big visual design orange there. Um, you've got writing kind of next to it, uh, further out to that right side, you've, you've got presentation and business and marketing. And then all this orange stuff is what I would call kind of media, you know, media production of some kind. Um, and then we've got this pink um, computer science and to, you know, engineering type things. And then um, sociology, psychology and anthropology hanging out in the top left. So this is, I would say, a very broad picture of, of what UX is and what, what we do, but also you get circles and you get overlapping. Um, so there's, there's that recognition. Here's one, um, again, same, same kind of idea. I, I'm not a huge fan of this one because I don't think the, the VIN's very good um, because UI I think is probably bigger than just interaction visual design. I think there's probably more to it than that, but you see the big user experience encompassing um, a lot of it and some stuff hanging off of it, including front end development, which we'll get into. And then here's another, uh, another try. Um, user experience design composed of information architecture, just plain architecture, which is a little odd. Um, visual design, industrial design, interaction design and human factors, all this all kind of, it's all mushing together, right? I saw this one in a, in a portfolio and, and I, I picked it up. This is an interesting one. I, I, I kind of like this as a, as, a, um, as, a, as a part of a portfolio because it tells me a couple of things, which is how do you see the world? So you see developer, visual designer, and UX strategist. You see this is kind of like the things that, that comprise uh, your view of UX. And then, um, and then this this person placed themselves there as the as the me, um, so they see themselves as kind of visual design UX, um, and not too much on the development. But she's, I think it's a, a, a lady. She kind of nudged herself on the edge of the the mythical triple threat, uh, being able to do to do all of those things. And the um, if we can pause for just a minute, the the well, we'll pause in a minute. Here's a good view, uh, and this is kind of once you get outside of the, the the focus of our discipline, I think that this is probably pretty accurate, which is when you think about the really big experience, 
um, the customer experience, which involves all kinds of, of aspects, especially in business to consumer industries. Um, this is probably a pretty accurate picture where UX is a part of the customer experience, but it's certainly not the only thing. Um, and uh, so I, I kind of like that one. So for, in this view, there, there's all of that complexity of whatever's going on in the UX bubble is really wrapped in this whole other uh, slice of onion. Um, here's somebody who said, I have to have circles, but I'm not doing Venn. So they, uh, they went ahead and, and just stuck stuff around a ring and said, these are all parts of it. And, and again, I don't, I don't have a problem. I don't disagree with the content of it. Part of it is just looking at the approach and how people are trying to articulate um, what are all the pieces of user experience. And uh, this one's not terrible. Um, this one I don't like, and I, I, I don't um, I don't know Pat. I don't know any of these people. Um, well, I'm, I've met Jesse James Garrett. But, um, I, I don't I don't know who Pat Dan is. But this was not my favorite representation. Um, uh, and it, it's there. It's trying to make some sort of connection between left brain, right brain, and, and UX and UI. But it um, not sure those are the best labels. Um, and then we have these kind of, I've seen a few varieties of these you may have over time where you get the kind of, we, we, run, we run the dog food on ourselves and we create personas of, of uh, UX design versus UI design. And we try to make distinctions and like the, the one on the left has glasses and the one on the right has a hat and you know, so forth. Um, and try, but trying to tease these apart in a little bit different way. And of course, um, even with the, with the anime cartoons, you have to have Venn diagrams to explain it. So, um, but an interesting way to think about it. Um, not my favorite, but there you go. Here's the one I like. Uh, to me, and this is from Crayon Data, this is the one that um, I, I, I sat down and uh, when I was working on, on this, um, kind of outlining this with Liz last week. Um, this is kind of what I had sketched out and then I, I managed to run across it on the web. And so I just, um, what do you call, uh, copy and pasted it because it's faster than I can draw it. Um, but to me, this is a really good, uh, me meaningful to me as to how UX uh, fits together. And uh, starting on the left, you've got human focused going through research the various kinds of design to front end to back end, and then on a, on a sort of human to technology continuum, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, you, you have, um, I think the graphic designer uh, role, I think that that kind of is where that fits. There's a little bit of overlap with interaction design, but it, it can be kind of itself. Um, uh, the user experience designer, I think, typically is in, in these areas, information design, interaction design, and research. I, I think it's really hard to call yourself a UX designer if you're not doing any research or any kind of validation. Um, if you're not getting into any level of interaction design, I'm not sure you're doing a lot of user experience or you're doing some niche version of it. And I think information design is very much implied in what we do as kind of a general term. Um, and you may get down into visual design. Um, and then the, what I also like is this kind of pink section, which is labeled UI developer, uh, as a combination of interaction design, uh, front end, and visual design. What's been my experience in, in working in different situations over several years now is these, these, are, the, these are the breakdowns uh, within people that I see. This is the, this is how, um, these are the skills that tend to overlap and, and coalesce in one person. Um, it, there are people who, who can do all of these things. Um, but what I find is that when, and I, and I work with, I have worked with those people, I work with one now or a couple now, even if you can do all of these things and have the skill set to do all of these things, let's leave the back end out of the picture. You don't have time, typically, um, you, to bring all of this to bear um, on any on any given project. So you're you're 
and, and it does that Swiss, that Swiss Army knife analogy is good, which is, yeah, it, it has a, a fishing thing on it, but you, you can't actually fish with it. And it has a saw, but you're not going to saw much with it. You, it, 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 you, you just, you, you run out of, of uh, time and bandwidth to really bring all of your skills to bear at one time. And so you, you tend to get into to these roles that, that coalesce around these competencies. And in my mind, this, this, um, this graphic that you're looking at here is, is a really good explanation of what I have seen in experience and practice of how these skills tend to go together. You tend to get interaction design, visual design, and front end type people that, that develop. So uh, they may start in graphic design, but um, they, they kind of go up and over into interaction and, and into front end. Um, information design going back into research. It, that's the user-centered part of the work is you're actually doing research to, to, to center it on the user, not, not using other sorts of inspiration typically. But, um, and uh, maybe we'll pause now. I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear um, anyone else's feedback or response, or if you, you, you liked one of the other ones, um, I can certainly flip back, but how does this resonate with your experience? This one. I'll go. Um, okay. I like this one a lot. Um, I feel like it shows how you can bleed, you know, how you kind of touch on other things and how you, you, how you might be interested if, if you're, if you are a user experience designer and your expertise is research and you're kind of weak in information design, like it's, it's a good map to show where you might want to expand your skill set, like the most logical fit, right? For you to move next yeah. or to improve. Uh, yeah. So I really like that uh, as a, a visual representation of where you might want to enhance your skills. Good. I like how it has the two spectrums, the human focused on the one side and the technology focused on the other side, because I think, most teams that I work with sort of forget the human part of it all. And um, so I, I like that it shows both ends. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's pretty, even within, within the, the broad domain of user experience, there, there are definitely people who are closer to the technology than they are to the users. Right. Uh, Jason, uh, thank you. This is a nice, a uh, couple of, uh, just um, uh, from my education sake, I've not seen much emphasis on the, I would say the topmost level of information design, uh, like a, uh, purely how to present the data. If you go to like a stemon.com and those folks who, who are purely like a, a visual artist, if you will. So I've not seen in my 20 years career, mostly in industrial area, those people interacting in this uh, process. And the second, uh, I just wanted feedback from the team. The historically, when I started in GE way back, this is like late 90s, uh, human uh, or industrial engineers were used to be a lot of uh, people mm -hmm. call them industrial engineers. So granted, it was not software per se. It was more of a look and feel of a product, how to use anything like iPhone or in that case, was a medical device. Those two, two people I'm trying to see where they fit in. Because the reason is this, that uh, granted, yeah, software is an important piece, but there's a hardware piece as well. So I think we need to do a little bit uh, work together to get them into the fold. So they have a lot of knowledge historically. And lately, the challenge is how to present the information, which is becoming very, very challenging. Back to your Venn diagrams and pie graphs and all those, and people are not able to get glean the insight from them. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's... There's definitely a legacy there that, that I think is not represented here. And certainly industrial design is where uh, certainly the first wave of UX-like people probably came from. Um, and, uh, but it seems like a distinct discipline to me now. Um, and, and I think that that's part of the the, um, the struggle where industrial design can look back at some number, you know, of decades of, of how they developed over time. And UX was um, still struggling a little bit with creating its own legacy uh, that's independent of, um, you know, ergonomics or, or, or human factors um, or, or industrial design. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. 
uh, who else? What I also like about this real quick is the visual design, how it's just really small, because that's what our tent stakeholders tend to grab onto is it's all about visual design. And, and this really shows that there's a lot more than just putting lipstick on a pig, right? Yeah. Um, Jason, I asked uh, in the chat that I'm not always sure what the difference between um, an interaction designer and a UX designer is. Uh, can you tell from a portfolio? I can tell from a portfolio, usually. Well, it, when that's the thing is, is um, it's, it's happened more than once where you, you bring somebody in for one thing and then you find out, oh yeah, I do that too, but I just didn't put it in my portfolio. So um, that's, we'll, we'll actually transition to that um, shortly because I, I, I have some portfolios I wanna bring up and we're gonna look at them. Um, but before we do that, um, I don't, I don't wanna short circuit this discussion. I think it's good. Is there uh, anyone else have feedback or comment on any of these models? Um, I actually think that <clears throat> this model is pretty great. I think that it's missing some components of like service design, which uh, that's a big, a higher level, I think, of all of this stuff, but it's definitely related. Um, yeah. But I actually think it's, uh, the, I think the biggest challenge that I'm facing right now as I look at a job market, for example, is that I think a lot of positions are posted with a description for one thing or another when it's really looking for another skill set or they're looking for the unicorn, that mythical triple threat um, that you showed in that other model. Um, right. So I think it's, those are, those are some of the challenges that I, I see, not because of this model is incorrect, but I think it's um, how people perceive the discipline and how people um, post positions like that. Yeah, the, the, the whole posting of positions is, um, is a is an interesting topic uh I, i've been on both sides of that and um honestly it it's it, it's still pretty idiosyncratic to make the connection to to somebody with the skill set that you're looking for so i think what a lot of times i've i've done on uh, when i've posted jobs is I, I i cast a pretty wide net hoping hoping to catch some somebody um, so, and, and I know, I, I see it in my son who, who just graduated from college and he's trying to get his first job and he's in that conundrum of first job, which is, you know, everybody wants experience, how am I supposed to get experience and all of that. And, and he sees these, he's telling me about these jobs and it's like, they want this, 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 they want 15 things and, you know, it's, and it's, uh, pays $12 an hour. And I'm like, yeah, so you kind of have to know how job ads get these job postings get put together to know, okay, if I meet one or two of these, I'm going to go for it, right? Because you just don't know, especially in something like UX, uh, where honestly, um, and again, I, I think, you know, from, from those of you I know on the, on the call, you know, um, you have probably worked for people for, for a, a leader of the team who doesn't come from UX and doesn't really quite know what UX is. So when they, when they go to HR, who also doesn't know what UX is, and they put their heads together, they're going to come up with something that's not maybe going to resonate 100% with, with you. And they may call it something based on their internal structure that may or may not make sense to you. And you go, well, I'm not an engineer. You go, eh, yeah, but that's what they're going to call you. Um, so you, you, you do have to, to read between the, the lines a little bit on that. And I, uh, I know from being on both sides of the table that, that you, you really are just trying to get a match. Uh, and um, so you need to get enough of a connection to, out the door to, to make it plausible. And then you really just have to see. Um, uh, and, and you kind of have to know yourself as to what you can and, and wouldn't be satisfied doing. But Lisa, I, thought, uh, I think it was Lisa who was commenting. Um, a well well placed point on the service design that is definitely something that is um, emerging as as a as a separate aspect of of that's really kind of being fed from UX um, and that uh, I would put it kind of somewhere in the that top left area right it's not going to go to the right side it's, it's going to go back on that left side and may encompass a bunch of these other things right maybe a big a big loop around the whole left side. You agree? Yeah. 
I definitely I do that. Absolutely. Yeah. I do. And then you'll also have to learn more about how the back end work. Like if you're really trying to piece things together, you have to understand how the databases work and all that stuff. So. The services. Yeah. 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 But you don't have to be an expert in all of that. I think you have to know the right people to get into that because if then, then you start becoming that unicorn that you really aren't. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and honestly, the, the value in it is, is, is not understanding how the databases work together because they're fungible, right? They can move. Um, and it's, it's getting people to understand how it's worth it to move the databases, right? How the data needs to work differently. And, uh, but yeah, excellent point. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Leave the, the big left, I think. Who else? So, Jason, yeah, this is Keith. I would just add that, again, for one level of complexity, this is great. But sort of when I work with organizations, the next level of complexity up, usually the research bubble moves outside of the design bubble, right? Because they're going to have separate teams. Mm. And so it's sort of like, you know, the, 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 the designer is focused on the information and interaction design, and there's no time for them to also be doing the research. So sort of when, when I scale it up for complexity, that's, that's probably the next change that would happen. Um, research is its, its own thing. It's yes. Own right. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that is a good point. I mean, that, that's, how, um, that's how we're set up at Schlumberger. Um, April runs the research team and I, I run the design team. So, um, yep, good point, good point. The biggest thing that stood out for me was um, that this mythical unicorn, it's not that you can't be an expert in it all, but there's not enough time to do it all. Um, so by my company, we're all trained as UI designers, and I'm trying to push that design's important. Let's not forget about it. So Monday, Monday, Monday is dedicated to user testing, and then Tuesdays, design and making improvements. Wednesdays and Thursdays, actually developing it and implementing it. Uh, and then Friday is te uh, doing some final tests and ready for Monday morning again to do some more user testing. Uh, and so I'm doing I'm doing the blue and the the purple sections, and it's just it's it's the time, not the fact that I can't I don't have enough knowledge to do all those things, uh, yeah. good quality to help develop the software. Yeah, and and that it, it's just um, it's a reality. Um, I, I mean, and actually, well, one of the one of the examples, um, one of the example portfolios I'll show you is somebody who who seems to be doing it the whole thing end to end, but he can't be doing it at scale, right? It it must have taken a long time. So we'll we'll take a look at that. That'll be interesting to look at. But no, uh, no, Daniel, I I think you're you're right. Is that even if you even if you said I am skilled enough to do research and code the front end and, and everything in between, you, you, you're just not going to have the luxury of in most situations um, in any place that's interested in money of, of running that yourself by yourself, right? You're going to have teams that like, like Keith mentioned, you're going to have teams of people that are doing research and interfacing with interaction design or UX design, or, or even, you know, around all the way back to the back end people to get stuff done. Um, but no, I, 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 uh, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I have some, go, go ahead, Melanie. <laughs> I was going to change the topic. So if you had a question about that, I was just going to add again, like Keith, you know, that I have clients that ask, Keith, can you do the interaction design? And I'll say, yes, I can, but I'm not very good at it. So let's find somebody who's really good at it that, that, you know, can specialize in it because it's important. Right. And then if they say, well, it's not important, you can just hack it together. Well then no, <laughs> then we'll have a different discussion. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I love people who love what they do. So uh, Alan, that, that I was mentioning before, I mean, Alan rarely went to lunch. Um, it, it, he would eat at his desk most days, so I'd go to lunch. And I'd come back and Alan would have like gone through six other cycles of different ways to do something. And um, he just, he, he loved doing it. And, and you can really tell, um, uh, I, I can tell you one of the reasons that I pilfer all of these images is because my visual design skill is not fantastic. I mean, it's arguably non-existent. I, I can't put finishing touches on stuff. That's not where my skills lie. Uh, but I appreciate people who do, and uh, I want one on my team. 
So I think it's, I think it's really good. I, I mean, I think part of, part of what is, is, um, is good to, to kind of reflect on this topic is what do you actually find enjoyment out of your work? Where, where does your, um, where do you get the, the validation of, of your work? Um, what, what makes, I, I don't want to say spark joy because someone's already stolen that from me, but what is it that, that really incentivizes you to work hard? And for some people it's, I want to be in the research, I want to be in research, I want to be in the fields, I want to be talking to users every day. Um, that's what I do and I want to feed that all back to the team and this is my thing. Uh, and other people couldn't, couldn't be uh, less interested in that aspect of it, but they will do 50 iterations of a concept and just, just keep banging away, banging away, banging away at something. Um, so I think part of it is, is, is what, what will validate you as a professional and, and knowing what that is and going, yeah, I can, I, I could do it, but it's not my thing. And, um, and, and really being, being honest and forthright about that is, is, is important for, I think, one's professional happiness. Um, I completely agree with you, Jason. Um, so I'm actually a master's student and I did my bachelor's as a computer science engineer. And um, I actually transformed from uh, coding to user research because I was fascinated with psychology. And even though I'm able to do coding, design and research, I, would, I still put myself as a user researcher because that's what I'm passionate about. And even... Uh, even mentioning uh, myself as a UX unicorn is something that I would not likely do because I'm pretty sure the the um, the research part that I can do is not as well as the developing and the designer part. And I'm pretty sure that the companies need as well of a developer or designer as a researcher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the it's it's look. I'm not gonna. We should all be striving to get more skills than we have now. Um, that, that I don't want. I don't want that to, you know. I, I want. We all agree, right? We more skills are better, um, but I think at any one time we're not going to be able to bring them all to bear. And uh, I, I was never uh, like a production coder, but I I have coded before, and um, that stuff ages so quickly. Like I think if you get out of it very long, you're going to be out. And it's going to be hard to get back in. You're like a Angular what number now? Holy crap! I know four. You know, um, and this it's eight is not four. So I, um, it, it you you do have some. You know, the, it's all these little forks in the road in your life, right? You have an opportunity to do this, and so you you spend some time there. You you go to a different place, and maybe you rehone some things that you did two jobs ago. So, but I I think kind of um, you know. One, recognizing that we all can't do everything all the time, uh, regardless of our skill set, and, and two, really knowing where where your heart is um, is is good to know, so that uh, you you don't sort of put yourself in a position where you're you're not going to be happy. What else? I know, I know Melanie has a, a pivot. So anything else uh, before Melanie takes us someplace else? Well, it's kind of on this. I'm curious why you think all of these kind of focus on software development teams and the roles that those play. I personally have a lot more overlap with some of our product analysts and the people who are maybe doing a lot of that client research and client outreach, um, probably more than I have any overlap with um, a backend developer, for example. Why? We saw a couple of where there was like business needs kind of listed, but we don't generally see those kind of um, product managers in these diagrams. So that's that's a that's an interesting one as well. I think that that kind of goes in the um, along with the the service design enhancement to this, right? Which would be I I have seen um, a lot more people, and it may be one of our examples in a minute. Um, positioning themselves as product developers or products, I don't want to say managers, that's not quite, more of on the innovation side of product, more figuring out what a product should do. Um, and what they're describing is very much UX related. And no, but you're, you're right. Uh, this, is a, this is a software centric view of UX. And I think that's because most people that are in UX are working in software. 
but there's definitely emerged. I remember I went to a talk, it's probably been six or eight years ago now, but um, it was, um, oh, I'm going to forget what one of, oh, Travelocity, maybe I, one of the travel companies, but it was um, the, the person giving the talk between the time that they submitted the paper and the time that they, they showed up to the conference, they had actually moved out of UX and into a product management role. And, and I, I took note of that uh, even at the time because I was like, wait a minute, because uh, UX, you know, I think we all, you, you're probably in organizations, you kind of feel like there's a ceiling, right? Like I'm not good, you know, I, I, there's, there's not a vice president, a C-level of UX in my company. Where do I go from here? And where you go is product. Uh, you, 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 you become a, a product innovator of some kind is, is what seems to be a, a good path uh, for, for people wanting to have more responsibility. And, and it really is just applying your skills in a, in a different way. It, I would say there's not a, a fundamental difference in what product managers should be doing and what UX does. And that's why we oftentimes pair up, right? Work together. So yeah, I didn't mean for this to be a comprehensive, but it's just <laughs> one I liked. It fits my world. Anyone else? Because I'll talk all night if, if we're not careful. Just uh, now, well, one question, just again for my education. I'm coming from the right side, like a technology uh, and trying to learn more, being into uh, management uh, programs and all that stuff. My biggest challenge is, uh, or interest is to make sure people are communicating very effectively. What I noticed that each bubble hands over uh, their artifacts, design thoughts, whatnot, in a specific way. And if the other side does not uh, respect that, quote unquote, then uh, the confusion starts, which leads to all the bad products and angry clients on. So, so I'm very focused on uh, what happens between hands off between these two bubbles. So any thoughts on that, uh, what, what is being done or how effectively this can be managed? Well, yeah, and yeah, I, would, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't, just to clarify, this is not strictly a process model, right, that, that I'm showing here. It is much more of a, there's a different continuum at work, which is not a sequential handoff. Um, the, but, but I take your point, which is, there, when you have multiple of these roles or people involved, there is some kind of handover from the researcher through some kind of framework or process, and that ends up in code. Let's just say if we stick in our software world, that ends up in the product somehow. My, my one is that's almost becoming its own specialty in, in UX is, is figuring out, okay, how do we efficiently our work in a way that can be handed off and consumed, right? Because it really is uh, extremely redundant to sort of like take a Photoshop mock-up and now start passing it down the line and have somebody else has to go measure it and give all, all the color values and blah, blah. And, and so that's why, that's why like uh, this, this pink section here in the middle, you, 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 you're tending to get a, more of that overlap with somebody go, well, I, I could draw it all out and, and explain it to you in 15 minutes, or I could just do it in 25, right? And, and so then you're really hooking up different, different aspects of handoff, right? I'm not gonna hand off to myself, but I'm gonna hand off now at a one level deeper than I used to. And so I think that, that those of us who are looking at, um, at, at UX or, or this whole pr uh, process flow, we do want to be, be on the lookout for tools that can help us economize uh, those handoffs. Uh, we want to look at people who can bridge more gaps so that we, we can have fewer handoffs. I mean, I think all of that is just part of building a team. And, and really, uh, when, we, when we look at that whole process, to me, the most important thing is for um, there not to be any surprises in that handoff, right? Like if we're going from an interaction designer to a front end developer as a handoff, this should not be a coming like thrown over the cube kind of, of interaction. This, this is usually a pretty tight engagement and iterative within itself, not a handoff of, of deliverables, but more of a handoff of responsibility, if you will, and, and moving the product along because there, there's too much give and take in those roles for, for everything to be anticipated. 
So it's, it's finding those melding points that, that you really want to be focused on and making sure that the interaction designer isn't just going, whoop, there's your style guide. And the, the, the front end developer is going, whoop, there's some CSS and none of it's hooked up, right? So I, I, that is a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a different topic a, a little bit, but it, it, it's the, where it circles back into to this discussion is finding those people who can do those multiple things, right? For sure. Yeah. Well, let's look at some, uh, let's look at some work. I know, um, I, first of all, I don't know any of these people. I hope you don't know any of these people, right? But um, I did get them from, um, can everyone see my browser coming up now? Does everyone see my browser? Not yet. We're still seeing your sample portfolio. Team. No. Yeah. Mm, hold on. Let me see. Zoom, man. Down. Oh, came up for a second. You Come slid it down. over. Nope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to try to. Is that what I'm looking at? Hold on, I have to figure out how um, my screens are working. Just one second. Yes. There it is. Yep. Do you see f shoes and stuff? Yep. Oh, yeah, good. Zoom out a little bit if possible. Zoom out or in? I don't know if everybody else, but we can't see the full browser, just a um, oh. zoomed in version of it. You want me to go full? I can full? see the. You can? Okay. I can, yeah. Okay, okay, no problem. Okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll just play a little game. Uh, what is this person doing? What is their, what is their skill set? There's a leopard and some leopard, leopard print shoes. There's an inspiration and some palm trees. Is this UX? Which part Fashion of Fashion design? <laughs> Branding. Graphic design. Branding. Yeah, this is this is pretty solid graphic design, right? That you you're trying to make you're trying to take a commodity like flip flops, add some visual styling to it, and make it more engaging, more attractive, express a brand. Judge, judge. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I I'm going to take for granted that this person is not the same person who is determining the attachment points, the ergonomics of this, the material that's being used. This appears to me to be work that went in to go, we want to set a seaside brand. Okay, here's a good image to represent seaside and here's my interpretation of that kind of brand challenge is uh, nautical flip flops like this. So to me, this is, if I saw this, what I would expect is, um, I would expect a graphic designer. I would expect someone who can, is, is uh, making that emotional connection with people. That is what they're trying to do. And uh, that's, that's what I suspect. And then of course, um, it's always nice to see other stuff. And if I look through here, I'm gonna see a lot of um, both online digital work and some product style, lots of some concept things and, and this is, I, I'm, I have a pretty good idea of what I would get from this person. Everyone feel confident what they would get? I, I feel confident. All right, now, now we're going to uncharted territory of um, me multitasking screens. Hold on. We're gonna look at a new one. Everyone see Kate here? All right. What's Kate? It, it won't take long. Visual designer, graphic designer? Graphic design, yeah. Another graphic designer, right? A lot of graphic design stuff. Here's her work archive for the last uh, was it 14 years. She has a style. She's got a <laughs> style, right? Wh whether the clients like it or not, yeah. And she's going to do this. So again, I, I'm going to get I'm going to get edgier designs here, right? Than I am out of uh, our first one, out of Stacy. I'm going to get a lot of color. You know, you, you, she's got her own vibe going, and so if that's what if that's what I need, 
she's throwing that out there and that's what I'm going to get. But it's good to have. Uh, here's a, here's a different one. Gleb Kuznetsov. He's working at the intersection of strategy and art. So here, um, I had this bookmarked, sorry, but apparently didn't get the right one. Um, here's an example of kind of that sweating the details uh, that, that, um, that I was talking about. To me, this is a this is a lot of uh, a lot of detailed diligence goes into these animations, um, figuring them out, seeing if they communicate. Obviously, he's going to try to make it cool. He's making something futuristic, but that also needs to work. It's giving status updates in an unconventional way, like that little wavy pattern is moving around. I'm getting different other effects that I'm going to get in most situations whatever this circle is doing, right? It's, it's communicating in a different way. I, I'm, I'm thinking he's more in, in our sort of interaction design space, right? This is what, this is what I call like an inter, interaction design specialist. They're sweating all of this movement. They're, they're, it's not just um, bring up credit cards, it's well, how? How, how can we do it in an, a different way, a, a, a cool way, a way that's meaningful, a way that is, is um, contextually relevant, a way that mirrors something in the real world, but in a digital world. All of these things that come into play, um, I, I put in that kind of information, uh, or I'm sorry, um, interaction design category. And that's why you get, and you can obviously see there's a blend of interaction and graphic. These things don't they don't typically exist independently. So um, if we all we had was <laughs> placeholders and action moving, that's not the same thing, right? We're, we're actually getting a feel for what this is gonna look like um, graphically. It's, it's more than just modeling it, it's, it's actually building it. So that's, that's what I see with him. And you start looking around, um, you start seeing, all right, I'm gonna see more things like this and this is what this guy does. This is where his passion is. This is his thing. So interesting. Here, I've got a couple more. I think. Here's Moritz. Uh, this first case, he's got a number of case studies here. We'll just, this first one is good enough. Um, first of all, this is a fantastic portfolio. Uh, he tells us the challenge, what he did in it, how long the project takes. Uh, brand and kickoff strategy, which is a really good way, I think, to start, especially with the nature of this project. Notice, and I, I, I feel like a lot of people, um, it's, come, it's, it's, it's reverberating, right? Um, we want to see stuff in progress on, on your portfolio. This is a really good way. I, I don't know what this says and I really don't care. What I know is there's work involved that he facilitated that resulted in this deliverable and that it's moving forward, right? Here, um, I really like this part. He says in order to, um, to empathize, empathize with different kinds of users, we develop so-called proto-personas which are based on experience and assumptions. It's fantastic. He uses the word properly. It is correct. It is what he has. It's not a persona. I think most of us would call this a proto persona. And, um, and it's a it's collaborative as part of this workshop. It's fantastic. Setting goals. This is an interesting one. Um, and what's really interesting with it, he got the team basically to say, you know, of these features we want to do, what's, what's the thing we should do. This is another thing that I think really should be part of all of our portfolios learning. In retrospect, I feel this exercise wasn't what the client expected because I aimed towards the blah, 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 right? He's reflecting. Like, I tried it, eh, didn't, didn't quite work, and here's why, and here's what I'm going to do next time. This is really good. Here's, here's the extent of the visual, right? I think they went with this middle one. Um, Here's the information architecture. They did a content audit. They did a site map. Here is work in progress with sticky notes. Um, here's a learning, which is great. 
we're, we're getting down to it. Here's where we kind of get wireframe starting, that we're collaborative. Here we start something that looks like a website. What I find kind of in people who aren't as experienced in this, they, they want to get to here, right? They want to show you, hey, look, I made this cool thing. It's like, that's great. Mm, how? I, I, I really want to see the how, right? It's it really helpful to see the how. And um, because if you just came up with this and you, because I could come up with this, I could come up with something that looked like this because it's in WordPress and I just download a WordPress theme and I start putting, I guess that's German in it. And now I have the same thing as you have. That's not the point, right? We, we all know the process that goes into this is what makes this work. Not because it looks good in the end, but because we built it correctly from the beginning. It, even in German, it works, presumably. So it's, it's really seeing all of those steps put together. And if you're not getting users involved, then you're, I'm, you're not a UX designer. You're, you're something, but, but you're, not, you're not somebody that I'm really interested in um, in having as a UX designer. I think you're, you're doing something fundamentally different than what I'm gonna expect um, from a UX designer. So seeing all of that, that, um, that team engagement, and in this case, it was mostly team engagement, but he does have others where he's, he's, he's validating with users. This is a really important part of what I look for in a UX design uh, portfolio specifically. And then we'll do this last one. Um, sorry, hold on. Just asking for links <clears throat> in the chat. Oh. Stand by. Sorry. I, don't want to I just shared it. Okay. Yeah, let me let me finish. Do you have them, Liz? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, this last one is uh, Katie McCurdy, and uh, I think this uh, hospital wayfinder um, is, is is a good indicator. Here we're. We're, we clearly have our, we have a researcher. Um, and here's, this is some, sometimes it, it can be a struggle. Um, uh, I, I, when I was a researcher and I had a portfolio that was reasonably up to date, I struggled with how do I present research findings in a generic way. And um, to me, I, I think that uh, I was probably overthinking it. What, what, I, what I appreciate about this portfolio is, I don't really do need to know what they're talking about, but when I see detailed walkthroughs and drive-bys and, and somebody with a clipboard talking to a stranger, I know that this is the right type of activity that I wanna be seeing. They're um, not just doing an interview, they're, they're doing it in the context of the hospital, so you kinda get that one level bonus point of, of beyond interview and getting into the contextual inquiry realm. You have, um, you, you have, uh, this looks like where I'm, my background is, um, but creepier. But you, you have the, the, the real problem with signage, which is here's a 4,000 foot long um, hallway with no signs at all telling you what's down there. Um, then you have, you've, you've all experienced this, right? We're gonna solve our signage problems with more signs, with much smaller print. That's how we do it, because people like to read. So the, you go that way and you find out, okay, here's some maybe failed attempts that we need to get some feedback on. Um, interviews with frontline staff. So you all recognize these people from the last time you were in the hospital. They're the, they're the two re retired guys that sit at the information desk. So getting their input is super valuable. So just knowing that, hey, it's not just the end users, there's other people that I can glean information from. Very good to know. Co-creative workshops. So this is another thing where researchers, I sometimes feel a little, maybe feel a little self-conscious because they're like, well, I just did the research. I didn't design the solution. But detailing how your research got put into practice and how you maybe followed through that, what, what that overlap looked like in your project um, is really good because research that doesn't go anywhere doesn't last, right? It, that, that, it's just not meaningful. So you really want to try to follow through as far as you can how your research gets implemented. And so she goes through design sprints, um, goes through, here's some ideas that got tested, here's some signage, you know, she followed it through. 
um, is basically what it is. And so you should be able to draw lines from things that we found from the users, went through the, the process with my team, came out the other side with this, and I can draw the line from my finding to the solution. And that's what you want to do as a researcher. So again, these are, um, I, I, I'm, like I said, I don't know these people, um, but, but I, I wanted to call out some, um, some highlights and things that, that when, when I'm evaluating um, a portfolio, the things that, that really stand out to me and where um, if you're in the process of putting together a portfolio, some things to be mindful of so that you, you don't mischaracterize or kind of miss an easy opportunity to, to um, impress a hiring manager. Um, and that's all I have. So questions about, um, well, anything. Sorry, I just, want, I just want to, if I can add one thing to one of these things yeah. we were talking about. Um, you mentioned how um, uh, in your portfolio, it's really about the how more than the what, which is, mm. or, which is a huge factor. One of the things I want to do that I noticed in these is these, these folks are obviously good storytellers too. They're obviously, or at least from what we can skim. And as we all know, that's a hugely important part of UX as well. Isn't just doing the how, but also messaging out to a team. And when you get a UX designer, that's an important skill set. How will they be able to communicate with others? And if they do it well in their portfolio, that's usually a very, that's indicative of a quality that's going to be pretty important. Would you say that's true or? Uh, yes, but what, what I find is, is often the other way around, which is somebody who is good at telling a story, but really bad at portfolio. <laughs> it's, it is, a, and, and um, I mean, it's honestly one of the reasons I don't have a portfolio right now is they're just a ton of work. They're, they're yeah. hard to put together. And um, uh, if I didn't have a job, I'd be working harder on mine. But it's, it's hard to kind of like in my spare time on a Sunday afternoon go, you know what I should do? A portfolio. Because there, there's about 400 other things I'd prefer to do. Um, but, but, I, but I think, you're, I, I think what, I, what I find is, is too often people are just jumping to the end and they, they, they take for granted the work that got them to the end. And that is... Um, oftentimes the most valuable part that I can glean from, from your portfolio is not that you can come up with an, um, an engaging design or an interesting design, but that you know what is necessary to get there. Right. And, and because I don't know your project. So um, you could have not done any user research at all. You could have not done any kind of touch points with anybody and, and just sort of gotten this design um, by happenstance or because the the bar was low and, and it worked good enough and and everybody said fine um, I, I'd, I'd like to see the work go in Keith yeah, right and I was gonna say when I've been uh, helping helping folks uh, describe what they do in order to get a job I often say let's not call them portfolios right now because mm -hmm. in your brain portfolio will mean pretty pictures and when we're all done, we could stick it in something and we can call a portfolio, but it's like writing this case study uses a different part of your brain and we have to think differently. So let's not think of, of adding to your portfolio. Let's think of describing this project and what you learned and what you didn't learn. And then once you do that, you can package it up in a right. resume and lots of different things. But that, that's great advice, Keith. I, I, maybe that is a loaded word for us. It, it, yeah, stuff. yeah. Again, if, if you look at the history of the term, it's all around. It's 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 the artist in us, right? And yeah, yeah. some of the things we do aren't aren't art. They're more science, right? So this is more like writing a mini research ish paper without the references, right? Yeah. Yeah. Comments. What he said. <laughs> Tell people how they approach their process. There you go. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm kind of of two minds about the, um, here's my process. Um, because they all boil down pretty much the same. There's some semantic differences. Um, your process is mildly interesting, but I've probably seen it before. I'm, I really want to see the work. I want, I want to see the process in action. Uh, someone asked me recently, um, 
they said, uh, you know, they're a graphic designer, but they want to pivot into UX design, um, which I think is a common, a common question these days. Um, if they basically have a straight graphic design portfolio, what can they, they really add to it to indicate that they'd be somebody you'd want to trust uh, making that transition? Yeah, you, that's a good question, Liz. The um, one is uh, I know what graphic design portfolios look like and they're not UX design portfolios. So it's, it's immediately clear if your portfolio comes across my desk and I have a job for a UX designer, I am not calling you. It's just not, I'm not going to, because I, 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 I know what's there. Um, so what, how do you, how do you, how do you break out of that? Right. Here's what I look for. Um, and, and I, and I, and I've seen it in actually in some of the students at UH, um, in, in Liz's, um, program. Um, they have a, I call it science fair, but what do you actually call it, Liz? Uh, we have the, oh my gosh, I'm blanking. Jasmine, what do we call it? <laughs> the career day capstone, something or another. Yeah, yeah, we have the, yeah. we have the career day, yeah. Yeah, so, um, but, it, but you know, the, they're, they're set up with their boots and everything, and so. Um, Red Fest. What's it Sorry. called? Red Fest. Red Fest. Um, but but here's so here's how to here's how to, to to break out of it right here's how to show me that that you're on the path you have to get users involved this is this is the key difference to me and and especially as you're trying to transition out you doing more graphic design is not putting yourself on the road to user experience design you getting users involved in the work that you do now either as part of the the generative creative process right getting getting that you know what should i be designing and and how should i approach it doing it up front and or the evaluation of the work that i have done it, it's it it's getting having that instinct to know i need to ask users on and the front end or the back end or both about my design in the middle so that's to me the 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 way that you that's what I would be looking for in someone who has an, a, you know, a, a graphic design portfolio, but they're trying to move. That's what shows movement to me. That, that would pique my interest. So, so Jason, wouldn't I say that depends on what UX role they want? Because if we go back to that earlier slide you showed where some people are more positioned on the UI and visual design. And that's why I think some of those earlier portfolios you show were successful if that's the type of, you know, quote unquote UX job they're looking for. The visual design ones maybe are a little far, but for instance, that interaction designer you showed, yeah. if there's somebody who's looking for somebody like that, they're not user-centered, they're not researchers, they're looking for a UI expert prototyper, then that person has positioned themselves pretty well for that role. Yeah, and, and I mean, there, there are certainly, I mean, I've had pure graphic designers on my teams before. Um, and some some transitioned more into into UX and some were more resistant um, that they they didn't want to go that way um, but but I I think part of it is is yes it does depend on what what you're looking for what what I guess what I'm looking what I'm trying to point out with with this kind of these portfolio whatever we're calling them um, walking through these different portfolios is is to if you just show finished graphic work, I'm going to assume that's what you do. If you if you spent three weeks interviewing people to get to your graphic design and you don't show it to me, I don't know that it's happening. And so you're you're limiting what you're doing, right? You're limiting your value to to me because you're simply not telling me the full story. By jumping to the end, um, you and if if that's what you did, then that's fine. Uh, then I'll know what I what I can expect from you. And if I would make not sorry, telling the whole story. That's that's a deficiency you should fix in your portfolio. Correct. And I would add that probably those other portfolios, earlier ones, could to your point, could benefit with more storytelling. Like even that earlier stage visual designer we saw the more kind of graffiti um, style. If yeah. she had pointed out, or maybe it was a yeah, I'm not really sure. You know what the brief was, what they were objective, what success looked like then we could really um, value that end result a lot better. 
Well, or even the first one with um, the lady with the um, uh, the flip flops, right? Yeah. So showing me the the inspiration image and then her interpretation in the flip flop, like, well, where did those inspiration images come from? Did did you find them? Did did a brand director give them to you? Did Why were those a good solution? Them? Right. Yeah. Right, right. especially like maybe she could explain how she actually understands the ergonomics of the foot more and that came into part of her design and where the toe hole goes right. maybe right. integrate that you know all of you know all of those kind of things that are that are a little bit lacking by and look i mean i'm sure it, i'll i'll speak for her she's probably not resting her the rest of her uh her career on her footwear work Right, she's probably interested in more other other things, but this is just an example of the kinds of things where you really want to um, think through how you're presenting yourself and and not selling yourself short on the work that you put in. I would also add to that, though, uh, to Liz's point about I have a graphic designer that's trying to transition into UX. You asked them that question because as a former graphic designer myself you still have an audience and you need to know your audience to make sure you're designing the right thing. That's something that carries through in this entire career. If they don't want to do that, that's your telltale sign that you really don't want to transition towards this side. Yes. Yep. I agree, Rich. So you have to ask that question first to say, okay, is this really what I want to do? Uh -huh. If not, if, if you immediately go, no, I want to stay visual. There's your answer. Don't even worry about that. You keep doing what you're doing. Be happy with what you're doing or, yeah, and, and that, your feedback has to be more than that's cool, right? You, you need you need a, a deeper level of feedback. Um, yeah. Other comments? There's nothing good on TV tonight, so we can just hang out. Jason, what's the best way to sort of um, show what sort of uh, what, what part of field you're in without you know you can't if, if the work you do you're not allowed to really put on the internet very easily mm. uh, how what's the best way to then show what you do if you know uh, quite often you can talk about it in person but just you know posting on the internet is sometimes like a no-go um so where do, how do you then balance that it's really tough in in um <laughs> in oil and gas it's really tough right yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of issues that's really, I mean, it, it's one of the more closed off places uh, as far as, sh as showing work. Um, other places that, I, that I've been I've, at Waste Management and American Greetings and, and previous little consulting things besides, it, they'd love it if you put it in your portfolio, right? It's, 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 it's kind of free, free advertisement for them. Oil and gas is different. There's some other you know, um, high tech stuff where it can be real tricky. Most of us that work in oil and gas understand that there you can't show us everything in oil and gas, right? Mm -hmm. And we occasionally have to chase down people, some consultants who used to work for us and go, hey, that can't be in your portfolio. Um, what we, what we, so the, part of it is just industry. You, if you're in an industry that's kind of tight-lipped like oil and gas, most of us understand that I'm not gonna see the full thing until I talk with you. Wow. Um, one, but you have to you have to show me something then, right? Um, two, I I would one seek permission and find out if you can do it. That's that's one thing. You know, don't assume that you can't show it. Um, so so you kind of have to ask. Uh, two, I think there's a there's a lot that you could do to anonymize the work and still show it. Anonymize meaning de-brand it. Um, maybe just take little pieces that that really aren't recognizable. And I think going back to David's point, you can you can tell me a pretty good story and and not not name the innocent, you know. Yeah. Um, so that I think that that's it, it's real tricky. Uh, one, I, I don't want to. I'm not going to say it's easy, and I don't have the answer for it. But I think that there's probably some something that you can throw out there that that is um, anonymous enough that lets me know you know what you're doing without telling me you know what Exxon Mobil is doing next quarter. Yeah. So just so watching you read the portfolios, you you use the images quite a lot, but I, I have no images of my work <laughs> um, anywhere to put. Um, so it's kind of I don't I. 
I could just give you a bit of block, block of text, but obviously that's you know trying to engage you and represent what sort of things I can yeah. I've done and stuff. It's obviously very hard without bringing that visual design across. Yeah, and and another potential way of of showing your skills is is um, if if you volunteered and and you you did this kind of work for you know a church or a nonprofit yeah, course, or something yeah. like that. That's a, that's something you can show, and and it's it's okay. I mean, we all know the bar's lower, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> that, that you're not necessarily like burning the midnight oil and, and your, your stakeholders are just happy you're there at all. Uh, we know the bar's higher in, in most of our professional work, but uh, it's another way to, to give some indication of, of what you do. Yeah, and, and for, for me as a consultant, right, I can't share anything. So the, the answer is let's have lunch, right? That's about mm -hmm. the only thing I can do is uh, I'll write a paragraph on my blog and now let's have lunch. Yeah. The last thing in my portfolio was from 2010. <laughs> was it waste management? <laughs> yeah, it was. Dumpster.com. There you go. <laughs> Still running. All right. Paige and I used to work together, by the way. I didn't just guess that. If nobody else has another one. Yeah. Um, so you talked about these kind of different roles and these breakdowns, and we know how it's pretty fluid. Just from your experience, and I realize, you know, the size of the projects, the size of the team could have a, a big impact. What do you think is a good um, separation, if, if any? You know, obviously, it could just be a UX of one, but we know that there's a lot of negatives of that. Mm. What would you, if you came into a company from scratch, you knew it needed some UX help, what would you think would be a good breakdown? I would do research. Research and design, to me, is the fundamental breakdown. Um, and you could even subdivide design into to you, what I would call UX design, which is going to emphasize more of the prototype and wireframing conceptual, um, and, and the, the final visual polish that's going to go on. And especially if you're in any kind of consumer oriented stuff, um, it, it, having a specialist that is going to be thinking about brand and going to be tied into trends, both in the air and in your industry and um, keep up with the marketing people and, and you know, that kind of thing. Um, that, that, that's kind of a full-time job in, in my experience. So to me, it, it's, you, you could do it with two people blending across, you know, these, these various areas, but it, it's kind of a two person shop to me is, is the right, the right number. Um, I, I have, I personally, and this just may be me and I, I can't get in anybody else's head, I have a really hard time transitioning between research and design thinking, not design thinking trademark, just thinking as a designer versus uh, thinking as a researcher. So um, it's, it's, it's uh, aside from the bandwidth issues, it, it really is just moving a different part of your brain. And so when I'm in research mode, it's re if I'm in research mo mode in the morning, I'm not going to be in design mode in the afternoon. I might be in design mode in a couple of days. I mean, it's, it's, it's so there's, to me, there's a, there's a definite productivity cost in trying to switch uh, from research to design. Um, and, and that's why I, I like to have the split roles if possible. And I, I, I'd, I'd be curious to hear if anybody else has experienced that. Or it could just be me. I mean, who knows? yeah, I was going to say from also just from the, like the quality perspective again, like mm -hmm. if it's a small, simple thing, you can be hopping back and forth between research and design while you're doing it. Yeah. But, but if it's too complicated, then those brain cells that you're putting on design, you, sh you know, they're going to be getting in the way of your research. Right. Yeah. The so, synthesis is different. Right. To me, and I would know. probably say that same um, kind of difficulty is with design and developers. I, I've known a few oh. UI designers, who develop as well and you see during the course of a week or a month they start to really flow towards one side right. and they'll spend less and less time even right. worrying about UI let alone UX or research and they get stuck in the development world so usually I find you almost kind of want a hard stop there if possible because it's yeah good yeah they, they, uh, a similar similar experience I mean it, it's almost always gonna you're gonna tend toward the development side because that's where you have 
real deadlines and tie-ins that are specific and people waiting on you and griping to the project manager that they're waiting on you and you know that there's real consequences there so what what i have observed is is what typically gets done is um they'll short circuit the design and the the iterations on the design and get to good enough in the code and yeah. that, that's that's a method but but um you're you're probably not that design is what's going to get squished right and i would say if it's a healthy organization then you can compensate but if it's an unhealthy organization that they'll, they'll keep pushing you towards faster faster development and then in the end you'll like crap i forgot to do the design right so didn't do any iterations at all <laughs> right just, just so. right from uh some some uh whiteboard sketches to yeah. code yeah, yeah. just yeah. because if everybody yells at you for one thing you're just gonna start ignoring the rest and, and jason kind of on the same point if, if we kind of take the opposite view where sometimes you have these big organizations with a lot of different roles just in ux alone um, sometimes these individual roles could have their own individual KPIs, like this person who's a prototyper. They're going to really be maybe going a little bit heavy on some of those interactions and stuff like that, which you can say the researchers are like, you're putting the attention in the wrong place. How do you get a team like that, a large team, to keep their, you know, you've got this messaging very early from research about here's the value, here's what we've really got. And as it goes into these different individuals, their KPIs of what important, is important can be a little bit different. How do you keep that message on track? So the end result is that accumulation of everybody solving that, that initial problem. Yeah, I think when, when you start to get into the, the subspecialties and breakdowns and you, you, you really start to, to, to get into individual differences. Um, and uh, you, you will, for example, get people who um, are really good graphic designers and they, and they, they want to do more UX design and they're like, I, <laughs> Uh, this one guy said, I'm, I'm 44 years old. Am, am I still going to be pushing pixels in Photoshop and Illustrator when I'm 55? He just, he, he was, he was trying to wrap his head around kind of like, what does his career path look like? And so it's not only balancing the, the work that's coming in and the skill set of the team that you have, but developing people over time and, and find, okay, I'm, I'm really good at this, but God help me, I never want to, I don't want to do it. I can't look at another one, right? You get into that kind of like, I, I need, a, I need a, a fresh thing. And so it's really trying to, to be, this is the individual differences. You have to know your team to know, okay, you're really good at that. I value you for that. This is, this is why you're here. But I, I understand that after 20 years of doing it, you're looking at other things to do. You're right. You, you want to grow, you want to expand. So now as the manager, it's our responsibility to find those opportunities for you where you can still um, do what you do, but find those, those opportunities for you to do something else in a way that's hopefully productive for the company and, and not, you know, tragic. Um, that, that's a good experience that lets you grow. When it gets into KPI, it, those, those have to get met, right? And, and I, I think most of us that, that work in places that are, that are metrics oriented, we, we understand that these are numbers that need to get, to get met. And so then it becomes incumbent upon us to find outside of that, right? How do I, how do I make this number, but also grow? and not, not just get, because the KPI is going to change in 18 months anyway. Well, just to be clear, Jay, what I meant by KPIs, I just meant like, if somebody's a prototyper, yeah. they care about the prototyping. They want to make the most awesome prototyping. But for instance, maybe some of the stuff they're doing isn't necessarily going to be the best for the user or whatever is, you know, it's like their KPIs become whatever their job is. And sometimes there could be a contradicted and the, the researcher can be like, actually, you're going a little bit too crazy. And this is for senior citizens or something. You know, you're going to start to, oh. whatever personal versus business yeah 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 so like i i i'm uh i am a prototyper so i will prototype whether we need it or not that kind of thing no more like i i'm the ui person so i'm going to make the ui ui is important to me so all my i got this thing handed over to me i'm going to do the ui the greatest but it's not necessarily the greatest for the user because i'm not the one who's doing the user research that's not i'm you know i'm 
my role is doing UI and prototyping. And also that's how people are judging me. So I'm just going to show them great UI and prototyping. And it's not necessarily in contradiction. I don't want to assume that this raises oh, problems. I see. So yeah, I mean, but then, but then, I mean, if that, if that was happening on a team that I manage, we, we'd have to have a conversation about what are the inputs to your design, mm. right? So if, if you're, if you're going, if the researcher is going out and doing work and bringing it back and, and it's going through the machinations and you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw this cool thing on, uh, you know, dribble and you, you go do that. The, the, that's a, that's a, that's a workflow issue, right? Which is, I, I need to get rid of one of you, right? One of you, one of you isn't necessary. If I can't get the research translated into the design, then we have a problem. I don't need a researcher then. So it's a messaging issue. It's a, it's, it's a way of keeping that story going throughout these individual tasks. And yeah, it's, and, 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 and going back to kind of that, that process topic is, is the, the designer has to appreciate at a whole other level what the researcher is doing than anyone else on the team. The, that, that, that needs to be, again, one of those special connections, right, where the, the researcher bringing back findings is not sort of treating the UX designer as another person on the team that's interested. They're like an insider. Um, they, they re, uh, in my opinion, they should be getting previews. They really should be part of the research process as much as possible. But they for sure need to get an advanced look of the findings before they get dumped in front of, you know, the rest of the team. Um, there, there's that, there's that kind of that camaraderie that needs to get built up between a, a UX researcher and a UX designer. Let's say if that's the handoff that that builds that builds the trust between the two so that the researcher knows what they do has value because the designer values it in a special way and that conversely that the the researcher is bringing to the designer things that they need to know so that responsibility really it it goes both ways um and so yeah if that's not happening then that 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 has to, that's a real conversation that has to happen. Well, I mean, I think that's great advice that part of, it seems like there's two things you could do. One is about the messaging, but they also, this is something we as UX designers are taught from the get-go about bringing stakeholders into your world so they're bought into it. They understand it. It's not a big surprise to them. Do the same with the other folks in your UX team. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Right, and, and I've seen those gaps happen and usually something like a critique will help catch it because mm. different folks will look at it and say like, that's pretty cool. That part that sings and dances over there is really cool. Why, where did you get that from? And they might say, I stole it from Dribble, right? Or they're like, uh oh, or that they said, because of the user research said our users are familiar with this type of thing, right? Mm. Then I stole, you know, I stole it from Dribble for that reason or whatever, right? So. So that, you know, when you start, <laughs> right. so when you, when you can start to break apart, like, why did you design it that way? Then you can check to make sure that they're referencing the research or they're making it up. They're making it up. Yeah. yeah. Which kind of segues a little bit into what Rich said about graphic designers who kind of flow into UX and those that maybe it's a different world, the ones that can be inspired. And this goes for any part of the UX team realize that that upper, um, you know, left of the left of their design uh, up a river, whatever you want to say, has a big impact on what they should or should have a big impact. Those people are the type of people you want to make sure are around. Mm. Yeah. I think a lot of these lines also start to get into project cadence and organization design maturity. Like we saw in my last job, our visual designers who were allocated to the project teams started to get really disenchanted with the process when we started working on a design language system, but they weren't a part of that. So there was another team off somewhere else in the organization that was designing all the assets and the visual designers had to use those assets. And then they weren't as excited about the visual design of their individual projects. So it can definitely change over time as you are building out these teams to understand what's needed, where the lines should be between everybody and what's needed at like a global level versus what's needed at an individual project level at each point in the process. Yeah, and also to keep them engaged, to realize that yeah. visual designers love visual design, they can be part of this team, but make sure that they're doing what they're, they love to do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
what is a UX generalist? <laughs> That's it. Somebody um, who's been shopping for a job for over six months. <laughs> It's, um, that's a that's a that's a weaselly HR term usually, of um, we d we don't know. UX person. Well, who who was that? Was that Mara? UX person. It's it's that it's the HR of formal formalization of that. Is it fair to say it's more of a c career level intern who's trying to decide which area they want to delve deeper in? Yeah, it's, it's given them the ability to figure that out on the job, but yeah, at a higher salary. No, than the there are no senior generalists. Let's, let's put it that way, right? So yeah, it it does imply um, kind of an entry level type position where um, we're going to figure out what to do with you, see see where your your interest and skills lie. So Lisa, are you interested in a director of generalism? <laughs> what, what's that? <laughs> I said, I want to be the director of generalism. <laughs> yeah, it's well, Liz, you're in a college. It's the, they have a whole college of general studies, probably, right? Liberal arts. Yeah. I would maybe put a different take on a UX generalist, to be honest. I, I don't know if I would put it so negative. I mean, I think a UX generalist is somebody who implies they can do every aspect of the UX. I mean, I know that there's probably a lot of negatives in that, this whole notion of a, a, a jack of all trades, master of none type of thing. So somebody who calls themselves a UX generalist, they can definitely be shooting themselves in the foot. But there's a lot of people, for instance, who are freelancers who say, look, I can handle most of this stuff. I can do the research all the way up to, and including maybe some front end development. But personally, I would classify that somebody as a UX generalist for good or for bad. I know, I think the, but I think the, the sexier title they're gonna go for is like full stack. They're gonna be a full stack designer or something, right? Form, yeah. Yeah, they're they're gonna they're gonna get a, a pseudonym in there that's not generalist. I didn't mean mine is negative. I just meant it as you're giving them the opportunity to decide which way they want to go. Yeah, it's more it's more of an implication. I, I would say that it's a if you call yourself a, a, a generalist, I'm gonna typically assume that's gonna be a fairly junior role. Because we, we tend to specialize in our in our our perception of title goes with that. Right. So I work with startups and they have, they don't call them a generalist, right? But they have a person who can do anything at a moment's notice because it just needs to get done, right? So li literally it's a, it's a get shit done kind of person, right? It's not called a generalist. It could be called anything, yeah. but there are some environments like in a startup environment where that is, that is complete positive, right? Any specialist is, is not going to work out. I meant that it was more of like an external term to people who don't necessarily live in the UX space, right? I'm trying to just get myself out there. <laughs> yeah. And lots of people are making assumptions of what all these things are. You can do it all. <laughs> yes, I'd, yeah, more like a, an HR person might call you a generalist, but Jason will not call you a generalist, right? And I might want my boss, who's a UX manager, to have some interest in all the different parts instead of just maybe research or yeah it, that's the weird thing is you kind of start as a maybe as a generalist where you go I I will do any kind of design work for money right you you give them that very junior role and then you'll kind of finesse but then to become a manager you you really do need a broad range of experiences you you'll I've had three or four titles right across many of these uh, groups you, you kind of need that again to really grow so that you know day to day what a researcher is dealing with, what a designer is dealing with, what front end is dealing with and all of that. That's career development stuff. Most of the generalists that I've met are actually UX designers, it turns out. Um, I think I, I don't see that as much for researchers because researchers tend to be pretty pretty clear about whether they um, are comfortable designing and no design or mm. not, um, or you know are insecure enough about their design skills to say so. Um, but the yeah, so the folks that I've met who are labeled generalists tend to be strong on the design side. Tend to be yes. Yeah. Anybody else? Maybe I would add to that. I mean, especially for people that are starting out, what do you think is a better way to position themselves? I mean, I, I, would, I think we'd probably all agree that 
understanding UX in general is a very valuable skill. But do you think, for instance, this, what is it, a reverse T shape or somebody kind of, because I, I talk to a lot of students and they're always trying to figure out how should they position themselves? Should they, going back to those portfolios, should they look like they can do it all, like maybe those, some of the second ones, or should they maybe look like they can do it all, but focus, really show an affinity in UI design, which again, could have some positives and negatives. I mean, oh, this guy likes UI too much, he's probably not gonna be a good fit here. What would kind of advice you'd give to somebody starting out on that? Oh, it's, it's to, to maybe over overextend or try to develop too many, too many things? Well, how should they position themselves to be strong in the market? I mean, I do agree that definitely what you want to do is how you should position yourself. Yeah, I would, I would say position yourself accurately, right? Like, um, you know, I, 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 I typically caution um, people getting into UX that there seems to be a tendency to, to maybe like make your own portfolio site, you know, make your own site. I'm like, well, do you want to be a front end developer? And like, well, no, like, well then, you know, you don't have to develop your own site. It's okay. Um, you, I, I think that if, <laughs> here, I'll just, I'll be honest, cause I don't know any other way. If you tell me you're a researcher, a designer, a visual designer, an animation expert, a sound engineer, and yada yada. And I look, and you've you've been out of college for eighteen months, and you've worked for six. I'm going to have lots of red flags about your assessment of what you can do. So I would, I think part part of um, part of being junior is is how to position yourself as a junior, which is I want you to be really good at one thing so that I can give you one thing to do and and then we'll we can grow you from there. I'm, I'm probably I'm generally not looking for um, well, I'm not even going to say that. I'll say this <laughs> instead um, since this is being recorded. <laughs> I, I, I want I want you to be good at that. The I want I want to know that you can do one thing and have some inclination into at least one other thing. But it it doesn't. I, I'm not going to buy. I I I can do a quick math check and go. I know how long it takes to transfer between these things, and six months is not the time or whatever. Right? I can just kind of tell. So um, I, I think so. I think what it is is being honest with yourself, and then honestly, you know, with with whoever's looking at your por portfolios, so that you represent what you do, and 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 I think that that is a mix of what does the market need, because we're not we're not naive. We we need to know where the market is headed so we can position our skills properly, but also and and here's what I do, so. That's that's what I'm looking for. I need to see one solid thing and one growth thing that I that I could expect. On a different note, nice quarantine beard there, Jason. You like it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I showed it to my mom yesterday. <laughs> Impressed. Yeah. She she said she she thought it makes me look old, which I know is not true. But I told her, you know, I'm, you know, almost 50. And she didn't like that answer either. <laughs> so, and I'm not almost 50. I'm almost 48. <laughs> yeah, mine grew back after my craze of shaving it, which. I'm yeah, I thought last time I saw you, no beard. I went crazy like two weeks into quarantine. And like I said, immediately regretted it during the first <laughs> buzz. And, oh, God. It's my first one, but thanks for noticing. Is this really your first one? Yeah. Wow, Keith, is this true? <laughs> oh, I didn't have, no, he didn't know me. Yeah. I, I might have had, I think I had one when I was 19 and um, in college and a pipe. And when I thought I was going to be English. Did you smoke a pipe too? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, all, we all had that face. <laughs> Fortunately, only one extant picture, which I cannot find, fortunately. It was good to go to college during the, the pre-digital camera days. <laughs> <laughs> mm -mm. 
All right. Anybody else? Otherwise, we'll we'll break up and head back to whatever we do at eight o'clock on a weeknight. Be the little one. <laughs> yeah, I hope somebody has another question. Otherwise, I'm going to have to go parent. <laughs> <laughs> No, oh Liz, you have to tell us. You have to tell us what's happening next week. You you cut out on us. Oh, next, next month. Yeah. So next month is um, uh, Amari Landasi, who's a, a professor of of data science and data visualization, over at uh, UH, um, and he's going to do his um, intro to data visualization talk. It's it's actually a a kind of a I've seen him do this talk, and it's. Um, it's kind of a, a cool and manipulative ways that people have done data visualization and um, how to how to get better at data visualization um, for both designers and non-designers. Well, that's good to hear. I, I got out my Tufty books uh, this evening and my computer is currently sitting on them. So I feel like I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're, that the benefit of, of Zoom is we can kind of do, um, we, can, we can do all sorts of stuff we couldn't normally do. So uh, if anybody has any wish list people, just hit us up, hit us up on the social media and um, yeah, Keith let us know. Stone. I, I think we should get Keith to come back. So, like, so I'm, I'm doing a presentation for IXDA Cincinnati in a couple of weeks, something that I've been working on for a while. I had to, I had to tweak it to do it remotely. Um, but it's discussion oriented like this one was. Um, I, I made a, buzz, a UX buzzword bingo to go with it. So yeah. it's, it's you know, I, I should have pulled one up. I could have probably play, uh, won a bingo with, with some of the words you said, Jason. Mm -hmm. um, but right. I, don't, like, I don't think we ever said digital transformation as one, but, um, but anyway. Well, we live it every day, Keith. We don't have to. <laughs> um, and then also, I'm not sure how much like Liz or other folks are paying attention to the other UXPA chapters, but on our little Slack channel, we've been trying to share things so that when, you know, if we ever do something in Michigan, the chapter I'm involved with, then you guys will be invited. So um, yeah, that's great. We're just yeah. trying to trying to get all the, the local chapters to, to share their stuff because. Yeah, like, can, you, can you share that Slack information? Uh, yeah, let me, let me pull it up. I don't remember how I yeah, joined or anything, but, but yeah. we have a, we have a Huxbus Slack, but right. But I don't yeah. be invited. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, yeah, it's uxpa.slack.com. Oh, okay. I am on it. Right. And, and if you're not on it, I can just invite one of you and you can invite the rest. I think it's pretty open, but. Okay. Like a bad party. <laughs> right. So. Again, and I've just been, I've been bugging the folks at UXP International for a couple of years of, you got all these great local chapters and they're doing, doing great content. Can you just amplify it and magnify it? And this, this has woken them up a little bit because um, they're, they're seeing all the great content. So hopefully at some point in the future, UXP International will also make it easier for, for you folks in Houston to find out what else is going on and vice versa. So. Um, for those who asked, uh, our chapter is huxba.slack.com. I pasted it in the chat. Yeah, and all are welcome. Yeah. For those, I guess most most of you don't know Keith, but I, I I go back a long way with Keith when I was up in Ohio and he was there, and um, he's he is um he would never say this, but I think he's an original UX gangster. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was I was a image of him, and it looks like it. Shop talk. He's got oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a good one. Um, yeah, I've, I've been around for a long time, and so um, still still here. Sometimes I feel like a dinosaur, but you know, so you know, the dinosaurs still you know have to pass something long before the mammals take over. <laughs> <laughs> You'll become a product owner someday. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. So. Um, All right. Yeah. Thanks, Keith. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Nice surprise. Yeah. Yeah, I, again, it's sort of nice getting a peek into what you guys are doing without having to fly to Texas, right? So, yeah, I mean, this this is we're getting into the gross time of year here, so it's probably for the best, <laughs> right? Um, and then again, like I've I, I popped in the the which which one did the the uh, Delta CX talk? That was which local chapter did that one? 
a couple of days ago. That was um, Austin. And there's a new group that's not UXPA affiliated, but a new group in San Antonio, which is which is doing some cool things. So again, like I've I've been hanging out with people in Texas as much as I've been hanging out with people in Ohio the past month, just by chance. Okay, very cool. That's awesome. Cool. We'll look into that for sure. And yes, I would love to have you speak. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, if you need to uh, get an invite to the Huxba Slack channel, um, just drop a line to UXPA Houston, one word, at Gmail. Okay. And do come that. on into the party. Yeah, and that goes for everybody on here. Yeah. Everybody left. Yeah, we got it. But well, they, you know, if they listen to the recording and they. Yeah, I am luckily recording it. I started recording at uh, the first slide, so got the whole Yeah. Thing. Thank you. Uh, I love a good computer crash at a poorly timed moment. <laughs> well, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, good way to spend a few hours. Nice meeting with you all. Thanks for having us in your mansion. <laughs> right? You can I know what I'm doing. My husband just made me a margarita. Oh. I'm a kid. You feel like door dashing or what? That's my husband. He came home from work and made me a margarita. I should get one of those. We should one of those husbands that makes you a margarita when you get home from work. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm saying is oh, spec test <laughs> curbside. <laughs> I spend an awful lot of time looking at other people's uh, really good food and drinks on Zoom these days. <laughs> Y'all have a good yeah, one. All right. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. everybody. Thanks, Jason. And thanks, everybody, for participating. All right. Good night. Stay safe. You too.